Hello, good evening and welcome. You are here with us, the Oasis Church. My name is Angus and tonight we're going to be going live with Rob Gibson from Harvard House. I'm very excited for this evening's chat. We're going to be having lots and lots of fun and learning a lot along the way as well. We chat as we speak and he'll be joining us in just a moment. Rob, good evening. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. Hello, Angus. How are you doing? I'm well, thank you. So just as an introduction, I will introduce you. If you don't mind, please feel free to add or exclude anything that I say, should you feel the need to do so. Um, okay. For those of you who don't know, Robin Gibson is a director at Harvard House. He is a financial guru, in my own words. Um, he is someone who knows about markets and investing. And on a personal note, uh, Robin has been talking to me for 20 years about investing and how to do so, and has certainly given me solid advice over that time and has spoken into my life and created great value in how we invest, why we invest. I still remember to this day sitting in a lecture with um, Robin and him explaining the power of compound interest and it blew my mind and I suddenly realized that I had to plan for my future very carefully if I hoped to see the future play out the way that I'd hoped to see it play out. So welcome Robin, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks Gus, it's always dangerous when you call someone a guru. <laughs> well, I mean it in all of the best ways. <laughs> Thank you. No, it's good to be here. Thanks for having me, guys. Great, great pleasure to have you. Thank you very much. So tonight we've got some questions that we're going to run through. If you are joining us, welcome. It's so great to have you. Thank you for joining us. If you are wanting to post a question, feel free to do so. We'd love to have you um, give your input. And wherever we can, we'll add your question to the mix. Otherwise, we'll take structured questions at the end. But to start off with, Rob, uh, I, I used the, the complicated technology that we have these days um, to create a graph with many data points that shows us what markets have done in 2020. So here is my graph. As you can see, I, I don't have a printer at home. And um, it shows you the mar market um, and um, how they have fallen um, and co continue to fall. <laughs> Um, as you can see, very very accurate, up to up to date, up to the minute data there from all of the uh, international markets. What is happening globally? Talk to us about that, Robin. Tell us what can you say about global markets and what's happening across the world at the moment. Well, Gus, you know, I mean, I think we we're experiencing a shock that we've never had any time in the history of the world. Actually, I mean, uh, if you go back to the Great Depression or even the Second World War. Um, the fact of the matter is, is that business carried on. You know, even during the Second World War, um, you might be bombed at home or you could be bombed at the theater. So you still went to the theater, you know, whereas now with forced lockdowns, there's a whole lot of businesses that can't transact. And, and so um, we've actually had the biggest global experiment in stopping the economy. And really what markets do is markets measure the flow of money. And so when we stop the flow of money, um, the markets price that in. And, uh, and because we've never been here before and we don't know how it plays out, um, the problem down the line is nobody knows how to value everything. Everything we've known in the past, well, it really doesn't count anymore because what are we going to be coming out of it? What is the future going to look like? And what are profits going to mean? And ultimately, that's uh, what drives prices on the market. And so markets tend to crash when there's uncertainty. Um, and that's really what's happened. It's a bit like, I love to use the example of driving up Town Hill, which most of us in this part of the world have done. You can come up Town Hill on a night when it's clear and you can come up at 100. We, none of us ever go faster than that, I'm sure. Um, but there's other nights when you come up and you get to Hilton and you can barely see the end of your bonnet. Now, you don't keep the speed the same. You slam on anchors. And that's the best way to actually um, describe what the market's doing. It cannot see further than the end of its bonnet, so it literally slams um, on the brakes. And that is reflected yeah. in the pricing. So, yeah, yeah, it's why we've seen what we've seen. And, and I mean, we, it, as you say, the, these unprecedented times, I really enjoyed the, the information that Hot House put out. You guys put a whole lot of graphs together that you sent out to your investors. And they showed that there's been no time in history that we've been recording stock markets where this happened before. And so things are going to change. 
Do you anticipate that things will start to improve? Are they going to improve? Is it just going to get worse? Is there hope? So I guess if, you, if you're one of the followers of the market, you would have seen that in the last two days that, um, that our local stock market had two of its best days probably any time in the last five years. Um, there were stocks that were up 15, 20 percent um, in the last two days. And I think that's because what we're seeing is under the level three lockdown, actually, there's a lot of activity happening. If you've been into Howick itself, um, it looks pretty normal, except everyone's got their faces covered, you know. So, um, you know, that's, that's the real challenge. It looks pretty much the same. So I think, you know, people were going, we weren't expecting the economy to really start getting going again, maybe until the fourth quarter of the year, you know, around about September, October, November. Um, but actually, we're seeing quite a bit of movement now in July. So as a result, there's some positivity. And so, yeah, I think, uh, you know, the fact of the matter is people have to live their lives. And uh, no matter what the coronavirus is, you still need to go and buy your bread and milk. You need to pay your electricity. You know, you need to get your children schooled. And so the world ahead is going to look different to what it did going back. Um, but it certainly will, it will unfold. And this, this too will pass, as the famous saying um, goes. Yeah. So good. So good. Um, but what should I be doing with my money right now? I mean, I have a plan. Um, you see, I'm hiding money inside my children's toys and under my mattress. I, I thought that might be a good idea. You know, cash, cash is not changing too much. So maybe I can just hide, hide it away. Is that a good way to, to invest or, or plan? Well, the best thing about that, Gus, is that, uh, is that you'll forget about it. And then you get a really nice surprise in about four years time when you find it by mistake. Um, assuming your son doesn't find it, find it first. Um, no, look, um, it's interesting. You know, I, I think Matthew 25 gives such a really, really good example about managing money. And uh, it, because uh, Jesus has the parable of the talents and he tells you to put your money to work. And, uh, and you know that the, the faithful servant, you know, multiplies the talent, he puts it. And there's some risk associated with making money go to work. You know, whether we start a business um, even when we work for someone else, there's some risk associated with putting money to work. And one of the things that I always take from that is, is, that, is that Jesus says this at the end of the parable to the, to the guy who buried his money. He said, why didn't you at the very least put your money in the bank? And so at the very least, we should be putting money in the bank, not in the mattress. And, uh, but we should put, be putting our money to work. And, uh, and, you know, the biblical principle is, is if we're good stewards with what we have, then we'll be given more. And so this is a good time to reevaluate our stewardship. Uh, it's also a, good time, also a good time to be investing. You know, this is one of the things is that uh, people panic. So let's just suggest that maybe you're a, you're a retiree. You might be 70 and panicking about your investments. But the reality is, is there's a good chance you're going to live to 90 or 92. You know, that's 20 years. Um, and so you should be planning with that sort of horizon in mind. Um, life is not just the next six months or the next year. It, uh, it's about planning for a lot longer than that. Um, so, yeah, we need to put our money to work. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, what I so enjoyed about the graphs that um, Harvard House put out was that at, at every point where the markets have fallen apart, there has always been some measure of recovery. I mean, it's, sometimes it's taken years, sometimes it's been slow. But things have never stayed in their lowest cost. Yeah, you know, guess the reason for that is is that um, what you have to understand is that the price of something is set by the new buyer, not by the current owner. So let's just take something that everyone knows fairly well, which is property. So you own a house, and um, and you know a, a major event happens. Um, let's say, I mean, something that's really topical for South Africa over the last couple of years, we've had this thing about expropriation without compensation. In other words, I'm going to take your property without any return for the value. And so uh, people go, uh, go panicky and say, I don't want to own property. And so ultimately, uh, the price of a house is determined by what the people who are looking for a house are prepared to pay for it, not what the people who own the house say it's worth and so actually your house might be worth a whole lot in terms of the bricks and the mortar and what it would cost to rebuild but actually your asset is only worth what somebody else is prepared to pay for it now when uncertainty happens 
the buyers all sit on the side and go, well, you know, I'll have a look. Let's see where this goes. I don't know what value is, so I'm not prepared to put any money up. And so they withdraw, yet you will have in every circumstance like that a forced seller, somebody who has to sell um, because he has no choice. It might be a deceased estate. It might be a liquidation. It might be whatever. And that sale actually determines the price for everybody. So as a result, because a sale does happen and the price is so low, and so if you're a, a holder of an asset, why give it away if you don't have to when the asset is mispriced? The best thing to do is to take a long-term view and say, you know what, there's a utility value to what I'm holding. Let's stick it out and, and, and carry on from that perspective. And that's the view that we should take, um, taking down the long term. Great. Thank you. For those who have just joined us, feel free to comment, feel free to add some questions in there. Um, we'll look to answering those as we can and towards the end. Um, back on investing again. So is now a good time to, to start investing for my nest egg? Should I be investing at all? Absolutely. Um, look, I mean, if, you, um, if you'd invested in the last, uh, the last week, you would already be very much on the right side. And history shows us that those people who've invested um, over a crash um, actually in the long run do very well. Um, and actually investing crashes are good things because they give opportunities for us to buy mispriced assets that actually unlock in the value. But there's a very famous saying by probably one of the, the, the top investment specialists in the globe, a man by the name of Mark Mobius. Um, and he was voted as one of the top 10 investment professionals of the last century. And he said, there's only one time to invest and that's when you've got the money. And so investing is something that you do on an ongoing basis, and it's a habit that you create. And you can really start very small. It's very easy to start very small uh, these days. And, um, and investing and saving are habits that you have to create. And, you know, Gus, many people don't invest because what they'll do is, is they'll look at the money and they'll go, well, you know what, I can't even get a checkers packet of stuff for that amount of money. So what's the point of investing? But time in the market and the compounding effect, you know, the, the compound interest that you were talking about a lot earlier, that makes such a big difference down the line that it can make a little turn into a lot. And I mean, the scripture talks about it, you know, the mustard seed producing the big tree. Um, and so it's a biblical principle, planting that mustard seed. You can't expect the tree tomorrow, but into the future, um, you have the shade to enjoy. And, and that's really what we should be doing. That's really good. And what are some good entry points to the market, Rob? How, I mean, if I've, let's say I've got 100 Rand, how do I invest 100 Rand as opposed to 1,000 Rand or 10,000 Rand? Okay, so, you know, I, I think there's two keys to investing in the market. Um, I think it's very simple. I, d I don't like complication. Um, I think complication gives room for people to um, take your money um, because they just tell you you don't understand it. You must pay us a lot of money. So I think complication is uh, to be avoided. But, you know, you can go and buy a thing called Satrix, um, which is really an investment that follows the market, and you can buy in uh, to that very cheap. Um, if you really want to play um, directly in shares, you can go and buy into an online thing called Easy Equities, and that's very, very easy for the average man in the street. Or you can look at a low-cost uh, unit trust, um, you know, if you've got a little bit more, um, in which case you buy a general equity fund unit trust and let the asset manager um, select a, a range of choices. So there, there are really some really simple entry points um, for the average man in the street um, to get in and to buy from that point of view. Uh, but Satrix is probably for the really low investor. It's a good way um, to start the saving habit and expose yourself to a broad range of the market over time. That's really, really good. And then, Rob, are there things that I should be doing before I invest? So before I start with anything like that, what should I do? What should I have in place before I start investing? Okay, yeah. So I think I think the key is is that um, you you should be making sure that you have some cash reserves. So I would I would really encourage people to have somewhere between 10 and 20,000 Rand in cash um, for emergencies. You know, the fact of the matter is, is emergencies are the single biggest thing that can derail uh, your financial planning. 
uh, because they come unexpectedly and it might be uh, my daughter's uh, geese have burst this last week. Um, so I've had to I've had to pay an excess on the insurance to replace the geezer. You know, now that was 500 rand. That was an unexpected expense. Um, and you need uh, reserves for that kind of thing. Maybe you have a, a, a blowout on your tire. You know, you, you go over something, you have to replace a tire. So having uh, something somewhere between 10 and 20,000 rand, and it really will depend on, on your household, but uh, I think it's a pretty good number in that range to have as emergency cash on the side because the last thing you want to be doing is cashing out investments that have declined and the reason why you don't want to be doing that is because you'll never go back in because you will have felt hurt so rather let the long-term investments be the long-term investments and have short term from that perspective and then the other thing i think you should be doing is you should be getting out of any form of short-term debt uh, really you should be um, averse to debt uh, in almost any form, I think, other than maybe a home loan. Um, so ultimately, um, you know, I, I wouldn't really look at credit card or accounts or anything like that. Make sure you're out of debt and uh, and get out of it as fast as possible. So, so save money and don't spend money you don't have. Correct. Yeah, and that and that really comes to and um, this whole area of budgeting. You know. Um, because, you know, budgeting is a bit like dieting. Um, it's never going to happen by itself. You've got to be quite intentional about it. Um, and uh, if you're not intentional, you know, one of the things I say to my children often is, is that if you're not intentional, then someone else is going to dictate what happens. You have to be intentional about life. And when it comes yeah. to managing money, if you're not intentional, uh, you will suddenly discover yourself in a really unpleasant place. Uh, money yeah. management is intentional. Yeah. So let's let's say I had a thousand rand, a thousand rand, and um, that how would I budget a thousand rand? Let's say let's talk percentages. So, but a thousand rand is a nice number that we can break up easily. How would I budget one thousand rand? Okay, so look, I mean, it, it's really going to depend from person to person and family to family because obviously some families, you know, there's, there's school children and school fees and so that's going to come into the equation. Um, and, you know, so it will be different. But roughly what you would expect is to spend roughly a quarter of your budget just over a, maybe between 25 and 30% on your housing. Um, you, you may have a home loan or you're renting, whichever that is. Um, then the other big items, big ticket items in there would be uh, your food, um, which will probably come to around about 10%. Um, your uh, transport, somewhere between uh, 10 and 15% uh, from, from that perspective. Um, medical, which I think is pretty important um, in South Africa, you know, uh, to my mind, um, you should make provision for your medical cover. Um, it's it's not great to um, to be uh, part of a, a, a system that's not working. So you do want to make sure that you've got some sort of cover from that space. Insurance is another one, and insuring your assets. You know, um, for example, just to give you an idea, the Giza that burst was uh, eight thousand rand to replace. Um, if I hadn't had insurance, and which cost me the five hundred rand excess, I would have been either in for cold water or, or um, 8,000. Then you've got uh, util your utilities, probably 10 to 15% um, of, um, of your budget. Um, and then you, know, then you need to budget for saving, you know, and you need to be pretty intentional with that. And probably the one that I think is key for everybody is, um, and particularly we're talking in a context of a, of a biblical perspective, uh, tithing's got to be the first thing uh, that comes off your equation. Um, you know, Gus, uh, for me, if there's been any success in my finances, it's actually just because I've lived by the biblical prin principles and, uh, and tithing has to be the key to that. And so yeah. uh, giving, you know, for me, it starts at the 10%. And, uh, you know, we're all very familiar with Malachi 3, uh, which is, you know, um, bring in your full tithe because you're actually stealing from God and he calls um, down that there would be a blessing. 
But, you know, the interesting thing is if you go and read that Malachi 3, it actually says that you've robbed him in tithes and offerings. And so, you know, we should be looking to offer beyond just our tithe. You know, the tithe is the bare minimum. And offering can come in so many different ways. You know, I mean, I think some of us throw our hands up in the air. But, you know, offering can come out of your time. It can come out of sacrificing something that you would normally enjoy in order to sow elsewhere. And, you know, David's perspective when he's looking for a place to build the temple, you know, he finds Abner's field and, and Abner wants to give it to him. And he says, I don't want to do anything that costs me nothing, you know. And uh, so when it comes to giving, it can't cost you nothing. Giving by its very requirement costs you something. Um, so yeah, those are, those are the basic principles. You know, one of the things I can recommend, if guys really want to research and, and resource more than this, there's an American guy by the name of Dave Ramsey. Um, he's he's a, a Southern American sort of, I, I'm guessing, Baptist. Um, he is extremely blunt um, and he takes no prisoners. And, mm -hmm. uh, and he is very brutal in commenting on people and their management uh, of money. Um, go and watch some of his uh, YouTube videos, and he's got some really good guidelines around budgeting and, and that kind of perspective. Uh, but he would be a good resource if people are looking for more, um, for more stuff. I don't agree with everything he says, but I'll tell you what, you can't go far wrong by listening to, to Dave Ramsey's stuff, and it's good common sense, biblically based, which is great. That's fantastic. And then, Rob, if, if I have more money, like if I had... A million rand or somewhere between a thousand and a million rand. What are the, the sort of like key points that where I should pay more attention? Um, what should I be doing as my money grows or as my income grows? Yes. Well, you know, like we said earlier, you've got to be intentional on your saving, you know. So, um, you know, I think what many people do is, is they go, well, I'll invest or I'll save when there's extra. And what that does is that actually leads to bad decisions because what happens is, is that um, guess people will get a promotion or they'll get an increase or they'll find that their income increases. And um, what, they, what invariably happens because they have the mentality is I will use the leftover, um, what generally happens is they spend it on upgrading on something. You know, I deserve this promotion. I deserve this increase or whatever it is. So I deserve this extra item. I deserve a new car or, you know, I deserve a holiday or whatever it is. And uh, what's really happened is, is that if you're waiting to have money left over, it's the quickest way to waste money. Uh, you've got to be intentional. And the best thing to do is to actually have what we would call a zero, a zero budget. So make sure every last cent is budgeted 100%. And part of that is savings and, and investments from that point of view. So certainly that's, that's what I would be doing. I'd be looking to have my, uh, my short-term savings. So, you know, that, that 10 to 20,000 rand for, for my, um, those risks. Then I would be looking to have probably between three and six months of um, my monthly expenses in a very, very short-term high interest account. And, okay. um, you know, I think that's become, it's funny, you know, because we've had crashes in the past, but we've never really in the last 50 years had an experience like we're having now. People have become very blasé about debt and making sure that they've got reserves to carry through. And yet we see now how quickly it can happen. And, uh, you know, if you are in a situation where you've got three to six months of, of your expenses, you're under far less pressure now in this kind of situation, and um, it gives you choices. And, you know, wealth is, is not um, something we should be basing our lives on, but basically what it does do is it gives us the ability and the freedom to make choices. So budgeting might be, be restrictive for some people, but actually I would say that it's incredibly freeing to live to a budget because you actually – you have the freedom to know when you're spending money that you can afford to spend that money. So yeah. a budget can actually be freedom. Yeah. 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 I've actually, I've heard your wife say that, that, you know, in conversation where she said that you know, someone said, but that's so restrictive. Yeah. And, and she said, but I know that I have that money to spend. I know that I can safely spend that money and not be afraid that it's going to cause a knock on impact or domino effect. Yes. 
Yeah, look, I mean, one of the one of the things that we've lived by as a principle, as a family in our lives is that uh, we've lived by a maxim that says just because we can doesn't mean we should. Um, and, and so it's a good way to evaluate money from that perspective. So once you've got those two things in place, then what you should be doing is I think that at that point you should be taking a two pronged approach. You should be um, and I'm assuming now that you've killed uh, all your debt. OK, because debt is something that you should get um, out of because it's really living on the tomorrows. Um, and as we know, uh, our tomorrows are not guaranteed. And so I mean, and many people have learned that now. So, you know, even a small amount of debt could have been a real problem in a crisis like this um, because you can't afford to pay it. And and Proverbs is quite clear that is Proverbs doesn't say you can't have debt. But what Proverbs warns about is what if you can't repay? And that's where we find ourselves at the moment. And it's an interesting biblical principle because if you go and look in the Old Testament, in the Old Testament, if you were indebted to someone and couldn't pay, they actually took you over. You became what was known as a bond servant. So in essence, what happened was is that you became a slave to them until you had paid off your debt. And the interesting thing is, is that we don't have such a thing called a bond servant anymore in the world. But I would suggest that the spiritual principle still exists, that as soon as you're in a debt that you cannot pay, you are enslaved spiritually and, mm. um, and actually stops a lot of the freedoms. And it stops the ability to be generous and to give. And, um, and you know, God is, is a God of giving and it's a God of flow. And so when we cannot give, we cannot create flow. And we are in a very, very desperate place from that point of view. So for me, um, you know, I, I think ultimately you should be driving to only have nothing more than your home loan. And once you've got the, the short term, that emergency savings and your three to six months of, of emergency savings on your income, then basically what you should be doing is separating um, your investments to be a portion for long term, building um, a, a retirement, uh, what I call a retirement pool, and accelerating the payment on, on your home loan um, to try and get that paid off in as short a period as time as possible. Yeah, that's amazing. And then are there ways that I can be saving during this time? I mean, Corona, everything happens, but are there ways to save at this time? Yeah, so I think um, I think there's uh, there's plenty of ways to save. Um, so, you know, when you start to get into budgeting, you know, it's a it's an interesting thing, Gus. If you um, if you go and have a coffee at a coffee shop, I know we can't do that at the moment, um, but that's probably going to cost you somewhere between twenty and twenty five rand. Um, you know, whereas that equivalent cup at home is probably you know under a rand. So if you consider that maybe you do that four or five times a month, you know, that's 120 rand a month. Now you add that and compounded and invested over 20 years, you would be amazingly surprised how much money you can actually save like that. And so what we should start to do is look, as we start to budget, we start to ask ourselves the question, do I really need this? You know, um, so maybe, maybe the idea is, uh, let's, let's just take a simple example. You know, some people really like to eat out. Um, and that's an expensive thing to do. So um, what about uh, doing it a little bit differently? And I know it means that, uh, that you've got to now um, do the dishes or something like that. But, uh, you know, go and spend the money on some steak and, you know, maybe some sides that you wouldn't, maybe a tub of ice cream you wouldn't necessarily buy. And those two things together will be a fraction of what it costs you to go out. So you've treated yourself, but you've actually saved um, from that perspective. Maybe walk instead of, uh, in, instead of drive um, or, or ride your bicycle, um, you know. Um, have a family games evening as opposed to, you know, doing, uh, paying for a movie or something like that. You know, we, it's the little things that add up um, that really make the difference um, uh, down the line. Um, from from that perspective, and and it's those things that derail um, your financial planning. So there's always opportunities once you start once you start actually get into the budgeting and you do the budgeting, then you can start to have a look 
And if you record what you spend every cent on and then analyze it, it may be a tedious process, but you will be surprised at where you're spending money. And the yeah. obvious part of where you can save um, will come will come into the equation, you know. And yeah. you know what? You can save to spoil yourself. Um, so I'm not saying that there shouldn't be any spoiling at all, um, but it should become a little bit more intentionally managed um, from that perspective. So I think all of us have space to save um, on things that we're doing, you know. Um, yeah. So yeah, that's those are the keys. Um, that's really then, excellent. If you don't know your budget, you can't find the spaces to save. Um, exactly. Yeah. As as Andy Stanley says, uh, you need to be knowing where your money is going. Yeah, oh, quite right. You know, because it, it does walk very, very simply. You know, very easy. There's a, a really good tool that Nedbank has. Um, it's called Slevens, and they use it. It tracks your money usage uh, automatically from your bank. You can link it to your bank, and it also makes projections. And so it yep. can even tell you what your projected spend is, um, which is helpful once you reach halfway through the month, and it tells you that you have overspent already. Yeah. yeah I guess, you know, we're in the age of technology. I, I haven't looked at the Nedbank one um, too closely, uh, although, you know, I have, we have a very close relationship with Nedbank. I know all the, the senior Nedbank guys well. They'll be horrified to hear me saying this, that I haven't spent much time <laughs> Um, but another one that's really, really good, which I use, is is um, is an old mutual backed um, app called Twenty Two Seven, and yes. uh, and basically what you can do is you can actually link in all your bank accounts into that, and and what it does is it downloads your bank account, and you can actually allocate everything in your budget. And so what it does is it allows you go that's entertainment, uh, that's a utility, that's insurance, you know, and. Um, and you can start to see where you're spending and it will even flag, um, you know, we've noticed an unusual expenditure on your, on your budget, you know, um, don't you think you should check on that? And uh, so you, you can then go and say, sure. I mean, to give you an idea, I'll give you a, a good example. Um, using the app, I picked up that I and um, Vodacom were debiting my account by one Rand every month um, for data. Um, and, when I queried it with them saying, what is this debit? Nobody could answer the question. And so, you know, I, I've been able to say to them, listen, and eventually got it turned off. But one rand is one rand. And it was going to somebody else, not to me. And exactly. so you know, knowing those kind of things can be really helpful. So, yeah, I think there's a, there's a number of apps out there um, that, that can do that kind of thing. So, Absolutely. Uh, so, so that would be, so you name, uh, I see there's a question there saying, can we rename those? Mine's called 227, and yours is called? The Nedbank one, I'll post the name later. I'm not absolutely clear on it. I've, I've used it before, but I, I, I turned it off a little while ago because I started managing my own money once I saw somebody else was looking at it. Yep, there was. Someone's actually posted 227. It looks like people there are... There you go. Yeah, it's Thanks. a great name. Yeah. Yeah. But we'll post that in the comments as well for the, the Nedbank one. Thank you, Rob. That's so helpful. Um, and then we were talking uh, just, you know, we talk about these things. What should we do with our money? I mean, we talked about destroying debt. We've spoken about the biblical principles there. Should I be giving money away? I mean, this, these are difficult times. What, you know, what does the Bible say about what I could be doing with my money beyond myself and God? Yeah. Um, you know, there's a lovely scripture in Proverbs that I really enjoy, Gus, and, and it says that if I don't water, I can't expect to be watered. And, uh, and, you know, it's um, the amazing thing about scripture. I think scripture talks way more about money than probably a lot of other things in life. And, um, and that's probably because money is the one thing that has become the unit uh, of, of transfer or how we get through our lives. You know, you, you go out and work for money. You then use that money to go and, and do day-to-day -day life, you know. And, um, and so, you know, it's... Um, they say money is a terrible master, but it's a great servant, and which is a, a good way of looking at it. And so ultimately, understanding the God of money, um, and I'm talking God in, in the biblical sense, he is the God of money, because ultimately everything good that we have comes from God. The Bible tells yeah. us that. And so money is a good thing. Why? Because, it, because imagine if you grew pumpkins. Um, and nobody wants your pumpkins, but you want to buy milk or petrol. 
you've got a problem, you know. So the, basically the idea is you sell your pumpkins in return for money and then you can go and get your milk and petrol. You don't have to find some guy who, who's got milk who wants pumpkins. So, you know, from that perspective, I believe that money is a God idea and that he gave it um, to man in order to make things better. So, so he is the God of money, so we must understand how it works. And he tells yeah. me that um, in giving away, that there is a flow that comes. Um, and so, you know, it means I look outwards, um, I start to focus outwards. And, you know, and that's where the, you get some incredible opportunities for faith risks. Um, and, uh, you know, those are where the opportunities come. And let me tell you, when you start to take faith risks, you see some incredible things. And I mean, Peter's such a good example of that. If, if Peter hadn't taken the faith risk, of getting out the boat. He wouldn't have been the only guy in the boat afterwards who, when his friends were laughing and saying, hey, you started to sink. He was the one who could say, but I walked on water. How many yeah, of you, yeah. you know? And, and, you know, my personal experience and Bev's and my experience is, is, that, um, is that you can't outgive God, but it's sure fun trying, you know? And uh, <laughs> so we, yeah, we've, we've had some incredible experiences where we've given and, and seen and the, the incredible freedom that comes with it and the joy and knowing um, that you're making a difference in people's lives. So, yeah, it's, um, uh, yeah. Exactly. Uh, if you, if your money's tight, I, I would really put this challenge out there because it's probably the only scriptural challenge that comes that God says, challenge me now in this and see if I will not pour out the windows of heaven. I mean, we're quoting Malachi three again. So when we get into that space, God is, inviting you to challenge him in this space. Now make sure you're doing it with the right heart. So don't go and give all your money away and then look for it from there. Because I believe that, um, you know, Gus, let me give you an idea. I, I, I bought a motor vehicle, um, a four by four, um, in order to really get my boat in and out of Midmar because it was getting so muddy and I kept getting stuck and having to ask someone to pull me out. So I, I changed my bucky for a four by four. And, um, you know, I bought a vehicle that had well over 100,000 kilometers on the clock. And, um, and that vehicle now has 230,000 k's on the clock. We've done missions up to Swaziland. Uh, we've been all over the country. And, uh, and, you know, the amazing thing is, is that that vehicle is, is in great shape. And I haven't had to spend major money on it. And, uh, and when I look at that, if I take the time to sit back and think about it, I believe that that's part of the, the you know, the windows of heaven being open. Is is that you know, um, I've had trouble free motoring, and so I believe that that's a blessing from God. It's God has sort of bound up some of the holes that sometimes cost you um, cost you uh, expenses, you know, and yeah. see your money go away. And um, and so I believe. Um, hugely in the giving process, but it is combined with your heart. Um, you yeah. can't. If you if you're giving to get, um, then I, I think you're in trouble. Yeah. But if you're giving, if you're giving because you recognise that um, God gave it to you first, and you want to be available as an instrument of His, then I think you can start to take faith steps. So. You know, don't be stupid in this, but uh, start to stretch yourself and say, yeah. actually, who's, who's in greater need? And you can, as I say, you can do it in, in really simple ways. Um, you know, a number of years ago, what, um, what Bev and I did just as something completely different was, um, was we felt there was a family in the life of the church who'd never really had the opportunity to have a great holiday. And so what we did to them was we, we went and sat to them and said, so what do you do on your holidays? You know, what are the things that, that you guys will typically do on a holiday? And they said, oh, you know, we'll, we'll maybe go to the dam and ride our bicycles or, you know, we might go out for an ice cream or something like that. And so what we did as a family was we swapped. And we've been fortunate to have holidays. We actually swapped with that family our holiday. So we said to them, actually, you know what, this is what we had planned for our holiday. Here's our holiday. Um, the accommodation's all s sorted. Here's our budgeting in terms of what we had, in terms of the stuff we were going to do to enjoy. We're going to stay at home and have your holiday, and you're going to go and have our holiday. 
Wow. And, um, and you know what? So what did it cost us? It cost us the opportunity and, and, and maybe the things that they did that we could have done for ourselves. And I, I'll tell you what, we had a great holiday. We don't, we don't look back and say that that was an awful holiday. And we had the immense privilege of sowing into other people's lives, you know. And, and you just never know when you're being used as the answer to a prayer. Um, Good. Which is just awesome because now you're co-working with God. Yeah. Or, or, you know, you just get the pleasure of going, well, you know what, God used me in that situation. And doesn't every one of us want to be in a situation where we're used by God, you know? So yes. um, for me, that's key. So, you know, maybe give up your meal. You have toast and bovril and tea and take what would have been your monthly roast and give that money to somebody else and sow it or sow it into a building fund or into some yeah. other food elsewhere. And uh, I'm certain you'll never be able to connect the dots. I don't think we'll do that this side of heaven. But until you start making yourself a better steward of managing money God's way, he can't really release more to you. So yeah. that's how it's yeah. yeah. So good. You know, I think just to the question that I think is, is a burning one for, for some people at the moment is, is the question, and we've been talking about giving things, but what if I'm just not making it out? What if my budget is I don't have one or it's completely shot or I'm drowning in debt? What should be my first step? What should I be doing? Because as you've said, it's restricting. I'm actually in a locked-in position under spiritual bondage and unable to do what God's calling me to do in terms of giving. How how should I be looking to get myself out of that position? And are there things that I can do that can help? Yeah. So can I just say this to start with, um, Gus, is that I, I always say to my staff and my children all the time that experience doesn't come from what you do right. It comes from what you do wrong. And I consider myself extremely experienced. And so <laughs> I, I know what it's like to make the wrong decisions financially because that's where I started in, in my early days. And, um, and I know what it's like to stand in church and not even really be able to focus on worship because you don't know how you're going to pay the bills at the end of the month. So please don't think that in saying what I'm saying, I'm coming from a point where I've never, ever had some of these wrestles and struggles. Um, I, I made the poor choices and I ended in the pit and, and I learned from them. So um, I think the keys, the keys from there is, is that um, there's a number of things. Obviously, you've got to have a look. And you've got to deal with, um, as we said, looking at your budget, get some budgeting in place and see where you're going to have to suffer some pain in order to get out of it. Get out of it. And it may mean that you're going to have to sell your car um, and, uh, and, and downgrade. And, um, and we did that. I, I went from when I made this mistake. Um, all my mates thought I was very impressive with a very nice and uh, flashy a BMW. And one day they then saw me driving a much older a Suzu double cab uh, with plenty of mileage. And I had to take all the jobs on the chin, you know. Um, but it's an amazing thing is, is that sometimes to jump over a hole, you've got to take some steps backwards in order to take a run up. And, uh, and that's the key is sometimes be prepared to take the steps in order to take a run up because you can often not jump without taking that run up. And that's what people want to do. They want to jump without going backwards. So the fact is, unfortunately, you're going to have to go backwards. In Did you lose me? Oh, there you are. You're back. Okay. You lost just, just a second. I was slightly so worried, but here. not very. I'm still here. You were saying you, you're so going to have I, to take some steps no, back. Yeah. So sorry, I'm just going to have to make an adjustment here because what's actually happened is, is that uh, is that I was on full battery and now my phone is telling me I'm not on full battery. So anyway, we're on power ah. now, so I shouldn't disappear. <laughs> um, well, so you're going to have to take some step back in, in, in order to jump forward um, and uh, and take that pain, but I think it'll be worth it um, yeah. totally to do that. Very good, very good. Uh, and yeah. then just to dispel... A myth, you know, people often misquote the scripture and they say, you know, money is evil and we shouldn't have it. And actually, you know, we're called to poverty. I mean, I, I know that many people have spoken in those kind of veins to me. And I say, you know, the scripture actually says 
that it's the love of money that's the root of all evil. Um, yeah. And you've spoken about it already. How do you think we should be using money to leverage? You know, if, if we have money, what, what do you feel like God is saying into our hearts? And you've spoken about giving already, but, but how, should, how can we leverage money into the kingdom? Yeah, so I, I think um, I think if you if you have money, you have to understand that um, first of all, you may have it for a couple of reasons. You may have it because you've made really good biblical decisions and stewarded your money well. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, you know, I think God honors that. Um, the, the other thing is is that you may be one of those people who uh, find making money easy. Um, you know, and it's a gift. And it's and not really a gift for yourself. It's a gift um, because we're called to be in the kingdom. So imagine, imagine this. Imagine going to church, and I know we can't do it more than 50, but imagine going to church on any given Sunday and you arrive there and there's no one on the stage with an instrument. Could you imagine if we all had to just stand there and sing? And um, and so that would be, I think that'd be pretty awful. I, I don't know about you, but I think that'd be <laughs> awful. Um, I love to sing. I love the instruments. I love the guys who have that gifting. And um, But if they weren't there putting it into the life of the church, we would all be the poorer for it. And so the reality is, is that God has empowered some people with the ability to be in the business realm. So Gus, you know, for me, my story is I believe I'm called to the business world. Um, yeah. I'm passionate about the kingdom, but my I come alive and I feel called most when I'm in the business world. It, it, it floats my boat. It's, um, it's where I feel like my calling is. And that's okay. And I think there's many people out there who are wrestling with that idea. It, it's fine. But we need godly businessmen because we should be setting the standard out in the world. That's what God's called us to. And part of that is to then release finances into the kingdom. And so there's nothing wrong with, um, you know, if, if, if your cup is really big, think of a cup of coffee. You might drink that whole cup of coffee, but actually it still needs to be washed because some stuck to the side. So if God has called you to be the cup, you know, the coffee is not meant to stay in the cup. It's meant to be poured out, but something's going to stay in the side. And the bigger the cup, well, there's going to be more on the side. So, you know, the fact is, I think we, we must have this freedom that they will be, they will be the wealthy. But the reality think... is, is that, you know, Proverbs also teaches us that the rich man's wealth is his high tower. And, and that is the real challenge is, you know, um, I think many people within a church context look, to, look at those with money and they go, gee, wouldn't it be nice to them to be them? I don't think they realize some of the wrestles that those people with the money go through in terms of, you know, well, am I stewarding it well? Am I doing what God has called me to do? You know, um, should I be giving here? You know, do I give without with requiring accountability? There's a, there's a stewardship and a responsibility that comes with people yeah. with money, you know, and, um, and God has called them to it. And so, so I think people, if that's where you call be free. But if you're one of those people, you know, just like we've used the example of the worship leader um, and the instrument, it would be very in, it would be very easy for that person to get to the point where their gifting becomes the thing that they are so invested in, you know, and they love the idea of standing in front of of, of the community and you know leading the community, and they like the accolades that come with that. Um, just as they have to guard their heart, it's exactly the same for the man who's called um, to control money. Is we have to test our hearts, um, uh, you know, on that. And, and I would suggest that if you're at a point where you're not wrestling over your wealth, um, then probably that's the, that's a more dangerous place. If you're still wrestling, um, then you're probably, you know, then I think you're probably in a good place. Um, from that yeah. perspective, that makes sense. Good. So not more money, more problems, but more money, more responsibility. Yeah, I think so. Um, I, I, I think, you know, just as there's a responsibility to preach or there's a responsibility to lead worship, um, I, I think it's exactly the same. The responsibility sits with the people, you know. Scripture is quite clear, Gus. To those who much is given, much is required. 
you know and so and why would yeah. that exclude why would that exclude money you know and in fact i think it includes money just as much as anything absolutely. else so, absolutely yeah and I think it's important to understand that you know different gifts are given and God sees them no differently you know whether you're a pastor or a teacher or you're you're a physical teacher or or you're a money person or you're a doctor everyone has given some measure of responsibility to it yeah well, well let me let me just put two things in context from a money perspective um so because I think I I really I'm concerned when people get into what I call red wine Christianity, which is really this idea that, you know, if everything's going well, then I'm getting richer and richer and richer and I'm getting a bigger house and a bigger car and the bigger promotion and what have you. You know what? You've missed God's agenda. And um, for me, Acts 19 is, uh, talks about uh, God determined the times and the seasons where they would live so that some would find him. And so what we have to understand is that whatever we call to is for positioning of the gospel. So the fact is, whether you're a teacher, whether you're an electrician, uh, whether you're um, an asset manager, whether you're a doctor, it's to impact people in a particular way with the gospel. That's your call. And that's your yeah. primary call. And so and, and actually nothing monetarily could be added to you beyond what you've already got. Let me illustrate this point. If I said to you, let's say I had two people and I said to them, I'm going to give the guy on my left, person A, I'm going to give him a hundred rand. And my guy on my right, person B, I'm going to give 10 million rand. Now, if that context was, uh, that was, that was all they had, then it would be perceived that I have treated them unfairly. However, if both of those people already had a hundred billion, then whether I gave person A a hundred and person B ten million is actually irrelevant because it is insignificant in the context of the hundred billion. And the reality is, is that what we have in the kingdom, the pearl of great price, exceeds any of those things. And so that's the way we have to look at it, is, is that the question is, is if if money is that much of an issue, then actually I valued money over the gift that I've been given in the kingdom way more, um, you know, or I've, I've valued money more than the gift I've been given in the kingdom. And that's, that's a place that maybe we need to wrestle with um, a yeah. little bit more um, from that perspective. Um, that's good. You're basically, in different places. yeah. Then in that case, then we've made the money the pearl of great price and not the actual pearl of great price. Sure, and isn't it easy, you know? Um, so so I, I read an article, I can't remember where it was, Gus's, but um, the guy was saying that um, we all have dashboards, um, thermometers, and the world's thermometers are very, very visible. We can see them, the house, the car, the clothing, the holidays, etc. cetera. Um, our thermometers of our scriptural life are not as visible and um, and how often do we check them so you check your you check your worldly monitors often because every morning you go out and you have a look at the car and then when you drive it onto the road you look at the guy who got the new car up the road and then you go my car's not so nice so your thermometers you've checked your thermometer every time you drive your car or walk into your house or go to somebody else's car or house but how often do we go and check our spiritual thermometers you know what are, what are the things, you know, how, when last did you maybe put a thermometer on your fruit of your spirit, you know, um, and, and right. where am I on a scale of one to 10 on, you know, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control. Oh dear. Three, two, one, five, you know, um, and we're not comparing those against each other, are we? So, uh, but, but that's actually the kingdom side. So uh, that's what we should be doing, you know, um, it's a real challenge to get it into context. It's not easy and yeah. it's an ongoing battle. That's absolutely so true. And, you know, I think it's so important that we do, and we, we ask ourselves and those around us, how are we doing in those? Because, you know, sometimes those are areas where we, we're blind to how we're doing. You know, how's my joy level? I think I'm happy all the time, but, you know, my colleagues and my wife and maybe my children can tell me a different story. Ask your family. They'll be the most honest. 
<laughs> true story, true story. I'm going to open the floor. If you have any questions and you're watching us, thank you so much for watching us. Um, please pop your questions in there. I'm going to keep asking Rob some questions, but if you've got some questions, we've got some time now. Um, Rob, you know, anything in, in your wrap-up, how would you, you know, in, in coming towards the end of the discussion, what, what key points do you think people should take away? I mean, we've spoken about so much really good stuff, but, but if you had to sum up in like three points, what would be your sort of top three for, for this discussion? Okay. Um, well, my first thing would be to build in the stewardship principle with your finances and a stewardship attitude. Um, so apply that in everything that you're doing because so much of what we've spoken about will will feed out of the stewardship principle, the biblical stewardship principle, you know, um, the master coming to give account at, at a later stage. Um, the second thing is, is that managing money is intentional um, and, and you have to be intentional, otherwise it's not going to happen. And the third thing is, is, is that little sort of throwaway phrase that I gave a little bit earlier, you cannot outgive God. And um, yeah. so I, I, would, uh, I would say those, those are three keys that you could build away and, and it would be, um, they would be good foundations to start with. Yeah, that's really good. Rob, thank you so much. I so appreciate your time. Okay. So value that you're available to do this. So value your heart in this and your, your care for others that you're willing to invest in others and see them. And, and you know, I think, for me, the beauty of the kingdom is that we get to invest in people, and that's the long-term investment. You know, we talk about long-term horizon being 40 to 80 years, but um, we, when we're investing in people, we're talking about actually investing in eternity. See, Dom's yeah. put through a beautiful question there. Can we talk a little bit about paying off, paying down short-term debt? Uh, what are the different ways or what's the best way to do that? So how do we deal with short-term debt? How would you sort of gear towards paying off short-term debt, Rob? So that's actually that's actually really nice a nice one and um, uh, so Dave Ramsey talks about um, what you call the snowball effect and and if you watch some of his stuff he will talk about it and the snowball effect is picking your smallest debt and killing that and then going from that one to your next smallest debt and um, one of the things is now what many people will tell you and and listen um, I get mocked in my own family for my use of spreadsheets. Um, and models that are built. Um, and what many people will tell you is you know, that you should pay down your, you know, your highest interest debt first. Uh, but what Dave Ramsey teaches, and I believe it's key, is, is that what got, you into, um, what got you into debt in the first place was not your understanding of different interest rates. It was, <laughs> your, in, it was your inability to control your, um, your urges, largely. So invariably... Um, what the snowball thing says is start creating successes. You know, it's a bit like if you're dieting and you go and diet for six weeks and you don't lose any weight, then you're going to give up the, the diet very quickly. If you feel like you're making progress, then you're going to move um, forward from there. So what you should do is pick the, the smallest debt and pay it because there is a endorphin kick when you pay off that debt. And it incentivizes you to then deal with the next one. So use the snowball system. Start with the smallest one. Knock it on the head. You will have a sense of, of victory and celebration that will then motivate you to keep doing it from there and then move forward on that space. That's how I would, I would do it from that perspective. Yeah. And so would you say it would be better to do it that way than to consolidate? I mean, are there pros and cons to consolidating debt? Yeah, so um, I think at the end of the day, um, there's not many guys who are prepared to consolidate debt um, into a lower, uh, especially for someone who's who's in trouble. Um, the banks don't particularly like to be used like that. That might be the opportunity that this coronavirus um, actually gives you, uh, because there are the banks are offering some of these debt packages and you might have the opportunity to consolidate your debt if you can do that because obviously you're paying a lot more for credit card debt uh, than you are paying for maybe a loan or your home loan or a car loan or something like that um, so you know that debt might be a lot higher um, but uh, but look you can consolidate if you can do that but i think the better process is starting to get that feeling of winning you know because yeah. if you consolidate the debt it's a just a like, big mountain. Well, you've just put an elephant on your plate and you're going to struggle. You know, it's, um, yeah. 
uh, it's like focusing instead of saying I'm going to lose one kg or half a kg a week. It's I actually want to lose 50 kg. So you give up before you even start. You know. Yeah. Uh, one step at a time. So. Yeah, rather get the principle of getting the momentum going than necessarily paying the lowest interest rate. That's great. So, Rob, we are running out of time. It's counting me down, telling me we've got only 10 seconds left. I can't imagine how it's gone so quickly. But thank you so much. Uh, if you have thank more you. questions, feel, please feel free to ask them.